Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name, uh, for those of you who uh, have not met me, my name is Phil Skemmer. I'm at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and I was asked uh, originally, I think, to talk about rheology. Um, it's a fairly general topic. We have a couple of other rheology lectures coming up later in CIDR. Uh, Whitney Baer uh, and Jessica Warren and, and perhaps some others will, will be giving lectures later on that are um, going to be somewhat more specific, somewhat more detailed. I wanted to give a really general, um, almost painfully general overview of what rheology is all about. So I started with the title rheology, uh, then I added the title how to squish a rock, because I think that's something everyone needs to know how to do. Um, but then after Thorsten's talk, I felt uh, I should add a third title, which is what is ADA? Because we've seen a whole lot of ADAs thrown around already uh, in, uh, in this CIDR. Um, but what is ADA? What is viscosity? How do we know what viscosity is? And, and Magali, uh, uh, to motivate her talk, used the expression, looking behind the curtain. Um, and I think that's really uh, appropriate for a CIDR meeting. You know, let's look behind the curtain. Let's try to understand where does this viscosity term come from? What are the underlying assumptions that go into measurements of viscosity? Um, and so uh, I'm hoping that, that from this, uh, what, you, what you get out is somewhat of an indication of uh, where the problems are uh, in this eta term. Uh, what are the things we know well? What are the things that we, we do not know so well? So, uh, well, if I show this picture in the background, I, I feel obligated to explain it. Um, and uh, since we're enjoying our, our black and white photography so much, does anyone recognize this man? Anyone, anyone uh, from ANU? It's Mervyn, that's right. So this is a, a somewhat, it's a very young, I found the youngest and therefore the most deceptively young picture of Mervyn that I could find. Um, right, so this is, this is Mervyn Patterson, and, and Mervyn uh, being one of the godfathers of experimental rock mechanics. Um, he was, a, uh, in fact, a student of Orowan. Everyone had, uh, may be familiar with Orowan's equation. So, so Mervyn was, was one of the uh, earliest of the experimental rock mechanicists. And this is a classic set of experiments that he published in 1958, uh, looking at the brittle to ductile transition in marble. Um, and so these are experiments that were conducted in a rig of his own design. It was a high, these were, uh, it's a high pressure series of experiments, but at room temperature. So what you're looking at uh, from left to right is a sequence of experiments at progressively high temperature. And of course you can see this uh, going from uh, sort of localized faulting, which we're all famil familiar with, to sort of an increased barrel shape to the cylindrical sample that is uh, indicative of ductile deformation. And because I was having so much fun going back and looking at the, the, the old timers, does anyone know who this is? And no one's going to get this, <laughs> unless, you're from, unless you're from McGill. Who said that? All right, the McGill people got it. All right, so uh, this is Frank Dawson Adams. Um, and he is, he is really credited with some of the, the earliest high pressure, high temperature experiments on rocks. This is not his first paper, but it's the one with the best title. Uh, an experimental investigation into the activation uh, action of differential pressure on certain minerals and rocks, employing the process suggested by Professor Kick. <laughs> And if you read this paper, which is uh, sadly about 60 pages long, um, you find out that Professor Kick's idea was not actually very good, um, <laughs> but did, did make its way into the literature. And sadly, we are uh, no longer permitted to have such creative titles uh, in, our, in our studies. OK. Now, what a lot of these early rock mechanics studies, um, and by early I mean stuff like before I was in third grade, um, was, was to understand this transition between brittle phenomena and ductile phenomena. And that's something that we, of course, had seen in the, in the geologic record. We'd seen that in the field for a long time. But actually understanding how one should parameterize these sorts of, these sorts of relationships. Um, there's also something that, that had been seen in the, in the ceramics literature and in the metallurgical literature. So it's something we understood, but now uh, relating that back to natural rocks. Um, 
And what we understand now, uh, and this is from a relatively recent review paper by uh, Bergman and Driessen, uh, is that there are lots of different relationships between brittle and ductile rheologies. In other words, depending on exactly the parameters you choose, you can set your brittle tr ductile transition at various sorts of depths um, and with various sorts of relationships, and this has given rise to all sorts of different uh, food-related analogies. Uh, I, I don't know if the jelly sandwich is still in vogue, but we now have the, the creme brulee model and the banana split model and so on and so forth. Um, in subduction zones, as we've, we've already seen, um, there, of course, we have, we have brittle deformation close to the slab, but, but what all these models tend to predict is that this transition between purely brittle phenomena and purely ductile or purely plastic phenomena tends to happen at temperatures on the order of six to 800 degrees. Most of the, uh, the subduction zone system, I would argue, is, is taking place primarily by ductile or, or viscous, uh, I'm sorry, uh, viscous or, or plastic mechanisms. Um, I wanted to point out here that this is, you know, we think about uh, subduction zones as, as being the product of large scale mantle flow, but in fact, Viscous and plastic mechanisms uh, take place over a number of time scales. Uh, we heard about this a little bit in Doug's talk when he talked about seismic wave attenuation, something that I think we'll hear about later uh, will, um, uh, in CIDR will be post-seismic rebound. So these are processes that take place over very short time scales and very long time scales, all of which involve a certain amount of, uh, or require a certain understanding of viscous uh, and plastic processes. So that's kind of, uh, I think, the last slide I'm going to show on subduction zones, but just to motivate uh, why we are going to worry so much about the viscosity of rocks. All right, so back to the, to the, really, the really painful basics, what is rheology? Uh, rheology uh, simply describes the ability of a stressed material to respond uh, by flow. So it, it's, a, it's derived from the Greek word for flow. Um, so we are looking at these relationships between stress and strain, stress and strain rate, and those sorts of constitutive relationships that help us describe uh, particular phenomena. Now, rheology is not purely the, the, the domain of, of earth science. That's maybe a, a, a something that, that not everyone realizes, but, but rheology is just a branch of solid state physics. Um, rheology is used in, in the metallurgical literature, the ceramics literature, fluids and thin films, so from the more material science side of things. And then, of course, you can go over to uh, such important textbooks as practical food rheology. Um, and even more importantly, cheese rheology and texture, um, which in case, if you're curious and you want to pick this up at Amazon, cheese rheology and, tex and texture is very expensive. It's like a $300 textbook at this point for some reason, um, but it's very good. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and in case you're wondering why certain cheeses go on your pizza and other cheeses go on your grilled cheese sandwich, uh, that's all contained in that particular volume. Um, so the point being, rheology is simply describing materials' ability to flow. So it's not restricted at all to geology. And in fact, a lot of what I'm going to talk about now is completely generic. I'm not going to come back to rocks for, for some time. Um, all right, so uh, uh, continuing on with the embarrassingly basic definitions, we're going to talk about the relationships between stress and strain, stress and strain rate. So stress, so we know that stress is, uh, is simply force divided by area, and we can, we can set this up as, as a tensor, and, and we have our, our on-diagonal components, which are the normal stresses, and our off-diagonals, which are the shear stresses. Uh, for the purposes of this lecture and for the tutorial this afternoon, we don't need to worry about that. We're just going to look at the principal stresses, which are the, the mutually orthogonal three stresses that represent the stress, uh, that represent a stress state. Okay. Um, because this is derived from some undergraduate lectures, you're going to have to forgive a certain amount of active learning. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys some questions. What is the stress? So this is this is one of the one of the samples from Mervin's experiments in 1958. What do you think the stress state was on that sample? 
Where's sigma one? What's that? It's uniaxial compression. Good. So where was sigma one? Where was the maximum compressive stress? Vertical. Good. And what about the minimum compressive stress? Right. So I've already given you the answer. So, so because these stresses, uh, because the principal stresses are mutually orthogonal, the maximum compressive stress was like this, and the minimum compressive stress actually it was it was uh, axially symmetric about the axis of this cylinder. And this is a very common geometry for uh, experimental rock deformation. Okay. There we go. So we got that. Good. Um, Okay, so stress leads to strain. Uh, we've got our, uh, lots of different definitions of strain, but strain is simply defining a change in shape. Uh, in the case of these types of experiments, we'll typically define strain uh, in terms of, of elongation. So in other words, just the change in length of the sample. That's all, that's all we really need to worry about. Um, so just the change in length normalized by the initial length in this particular case led to a strain of 0.23 or 23%. Um, units of strain, anyone? Dimensionless? Okay, right. So, so the units of strain are dimensionless. Uh, if, we, if we want to talk about strain rate in the context of viscous processes, we just take the time derivative of this. And so that's why the units of strain rate are per second, inverse seconds. Okay, so that's longitudinal strain. Uh, the other strain term that you will commonly hear about in the structural geology literature, in the rock mechanics literature, is shear strain. This is one, it's not always intuitive to people, so I've got these, these boxes that I've, I've sheared to give you a sense of what, what these values represent. So shear strain, typically represented by gamma. Um, imagine you just have a deck of cards and you're shearing it, and so the amount of displacement along the top surface normalized by the thickness of your deck of cards, that is your shear strain. Um, so shear strain of one just looks like this nice parallelogram. Shear strain of five, 10, and 50, this runs into the next room. Um, so you're looking at some, some uh, extreme forms of deformation. Now, I'm often asked during talks, uh, what are reasonable strains in the mantle um, or in subduction zones? Um, and so I don't have a good answer for you because I don't think we really know. Um, but in, in, in situations where we do have good constraints on shear strain, for example, in some uh, mantle shear zones, ductal shear zones, this would be an example of a microstructure. So you're looking in, in a, at, a, uh, at a thin section of a, um, of a, of a peridotite that's experienced relatively little strain, and a thin section at the same scale of a sample that has experienced a lot of strain. And I would estimate that the strain in this case is somewhere between 50 and maybe 500. Okay. So there are very large, very significant changes in microstructure and rheology that result from large strains. And, and we're, gonna come, we're gonna come back to the importance of that um, in a little bit. Okay, that was the really basic stuff. Does anyone have questions on that before I go on? All right. So, silly putty. Um, I brought some silly putty along for a, a bit of an activity. Now, normally, uh, I have a 10-pound brick of silly putty that I, I bring to lectures. If you're interested, you can buy it on the Crayola website for approximately 100 bucks for a five-pound brick. Obviously, I bought two because you, five pounds is not enough. Um, and so normally, I would partition this out, and I would let everyone uh, sort of practice along with these exercises. Um, but since I only had carry-on luggage, it turns out putty, putty is TSA approved. So for future reference, if you want to bring silly putty along, you just print this out and you're totally fine. Um, how, however, uh, owing to the similarity in appearance with C4 explosive, uh, I ended up chopping it into little tiny pieces and hiding it in my uh, toiletries. So for that reason, for that reason, I only have uh, uh, this sort of uh, smaller than a baseball uh, sized piece. So, sorry, I'm not sharing. Um, I'm going to play with this myself. But um, we're going to do, I want to do some demonstrations because Silly Putty is, is, in addition to being like the world's coolest material, it has all of the properties that rocks have. So we should be able to simulate everything that can happen in a rock uh, 
with, uh, with some silly putty. All right. Everyone's pl yes. Well, to see that, uh, this is going to be the same material we're going to use on, uh, on Monday afternoon for simulating the lead sphere where we're trying to do the whatever is correct. So we have a little bit more than that. Uh, You've got, you brought more than this? Great that that's, you're that's, doing that. You're, you're braver than I am. OK. <laughs> um, Everyone's played with Silly Putty before, right? So you should have some intuition. I hope most of you have. You should have some intuition for how this is going to behave. Um, OK, what's going to happen when I drop it? Is it going to bounce? Now, it didn't really return to the height of my hand. And I think you know, Doug, Doug mentioned this in his, in his talk. Why, why is it? Why did it not return to the height of my hand when I dropped it? It did. As a matter of fact, it flattened one side of the of the sphere when I dropped it. So, some elastic behavior and some dissipative viscous behavior. Okay, good. Now, I'm going to sort of make it into a bar shape. What happens when I pull on this? What's that? Oh, I got some smarty pants in them. Okay, how fast? Well, all right. Let's say I pull on it like kind of fast. <laughs> okay, and that is incidentally, we've heard the word super plastic a couple of times. That's super plastic. What happens in rocks is not super plastic, but that was super plastic right there. So the ability of a material to, to deform to very large strains without a necking instability is the definition of super plastic. So there we go. Super plastic deformation of, of, uh, of, of the silly putty. Now, what if I pull on it really? What's that? Sure, necking instability just means the ability to become, uh, as it becomes thinner and thinner, stress becomes concentrated over an increasingly small area. Um, and so the necking instability is, is the, the sort of tapering off that happens during a, a tensile test. Um, in superplastic materials, it's able to achieve strains. There's actually a, a threshold. It's, I think it's 1,000% strain without undergoing a significant necking instability. I did say that. Uh, <laughs> it, and I'm on camera as having said that. No, uh, so, so super plasticity can happen in rocks um, under some very select circumstances. Um, but most, under most circumstances, the answer is no. Okay. What happens if I pull on this fast? Okay. It actually fails brittily. So um, what we can see from the silly putty, um, we've actually seen four different deformation mechanisms. We saw elasticity. We saw viscous deformation. We saw plasticity. And we saw brittle failure. Okay, All of that was with a single one pound lump of silly putty um, and nothing else. So what are the factors that controlled how the silly putty deformed. What are some of the things that we need to take into consideration when we're thinking about rheology? What, what controls rheology? Time. Time. Okay. How long was deformation applied? What else? Oh, I heard temperature. Did the, did the temperature of the silly putty change over the course of that experiment? Yeah, well, OK, fine. <laughs> um, temperature didn't change. Composition didn't change. Pressure didn't change. So some of the most commonly invoked things that, that you might hear about in a meeting like this uh, as, as things that influ we know influence uh, rheology were, didn't actually play a role in that particular set of experiments. All right, but, but you're correct. Temperature would be important. Time. What else? Stress. stress. So how much force, how much stress did, did I apply? And, and by extension, how quickly did that, uh, how quickly was that stress applied? And there's one more. What about the magnitude of strain? Okay. So I sort of divided this into, into four boxes. So the forces that apl I applied, the stress, how much deformation I put into the sample, and the rate at which that, that deformation happened. All three of those things influenced 
which of the four styles of deformation we were able to observe with the silly putty. And yes, of course, temperature and pressure and composition, that adds three more axes to this particular diagram. Um, but it, I, I want to emphasize, because, because I think people tend to, to leap to these sorts of conclusions when it comes to rheology, that all three of these are important as well, even if nothing else is changing. OK, so now I'm going to do, we're going to do some more mental exercise. And this may be something that's familiar to, to some of you. Um, but what I want to do is build up a certain amount of intuition for how mechanical bodies behave. And again, nothing in here about rocks yet. We're just looking at, at simple, uh, simple solid state mechanics. Okay? So we're going to use these three different representations of ideal behavior. We're going we're gonna to use a spring, um, which represents ideal elastic behavior, a dash pot representing ideal viscous behavior. Does anyone know what a dash pot is? Or where one might find a dash pot? So dash pots are often used on the, well, they, this is a bad example because it's not here, but a lot of doors, the, the things that keep doors from slamming closed are, it's, it's basically a cylinder and the piston has a tiny pinhole cut in it and it behave, and that's what slows it down as the, as the door is opening and closing, is having to push that fluid, uh, that oil or whatever it is, through a tiny pinhole. So a dash pot is, is just sort of a, a, a convenient way of thinking about uh, viscous behavior. And then the last one, which we won't talk about too much, uh, is, is an ideal plastic body. So the, the, the representation of this is often a sliding block, which I actually hate because it gives you some, it's, it's a bit deceptive uh, in, 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 in how it influences people's thinking about what plastic behavior uh, really means. But the analogy that's commonly made is, okay, let's say you've got to push your refrigerator across your kitchen. And I know everyone's had to do this at least once in their life. Okay, So you've got your refrigerator over here. You're going to push it over here. You push on it a little bit, nothing happens. But if you push on it a little bit harder, it starts to slide. And then it doesn't really matter how hard you push on it, it will continue to slide all the way across your, your kitchen. Um, and so we'll, we'll come back to that in a second, and maybe it'll make uh, a, a little bit more sense. OK, so this is, this, we'll start with some very easy ones. Just, just uh, ideal elastic behavior. I've got a plot here of stress versus strain. What's this going to look like in an in a ideal elastic? Straight line. OK, so the relationship between stress and strain is a straight line that has a slope. Uh, in this case, I've used E to represent Young's modulus, um, but it could be any, uh, any elastic modulus. Something has a, if something's very stiff, like a rock, it's going to have a very steep slope, meaning that a large amount of strain is required to generate a small amount of strain. So rocks have very, uh, very high values of elastic moduli. If you have a more compliant material, like for example, silly putty, the line will just be shallower. But ideally, it should be a straight line. Okay, so now we're going to do we're going to do these thought experiments um, where, uh, and it might be helpful for those of you who've got pen and paper. You can try to sketch these out in your notebook. Um, but we're going to generate what are called creep compliance curves for all of these different mechanical bodies. And a creep compliance curve is simply uh, a a strain versus time diagram. So what you can imagine is that at t equals uh, t zero, we're going to apply a constant stress. And at t equals t1, we're going to remove that stress. And so we're going to look at how strain evolves as a function of time. So elastic should be pretty easy. So imagine you know, this, this part is fixed to the wall, and you grab this ring, and you pull with a, with a constant stress at t equals 0. And then at t equals 1, you let go. And what happens? Well, what's the first thing that happens? When you first apply that stress, what is the shape of this curve? Anyone want to? Well, is, so it's going to go up. So strain will go up. Is it how will it go this way? Will it be curved? Will it be straight? Will it be straight, straight up? That's right. So when you first apply that load, you'll see it'll go straight up. 
and when you take the load off, go straight back down. So the amount of permanent strain in a perfect elastic body is zero. So that's, that's, that's nice, that's convenient. Okay, they'll get a little more complicated though. So, so if we look at a viscous body, um, same basic idea now, plot of stress versus, but because viscosity is time dependent, we're not gonna think about strain, we're gonna think about strain rate. So the time derivative of strain. So for an ideal viscous body, what is the shape of this curve? It's a straight line. Yeah, so it's going to look exactly like the last case, except oop, we've got our eta here. That's really exciting. So the first appearance of eta as our, as our viscosity. So the relationship between stress and strain rate in an ideal viscous solid is linear. All right, so back to the creep compliance curves. What is, what is this going to look like here? Take a second. If you haven't thought this through, take a second and, and think about it. So as we first apply at T0 a constant stress, what's the shape of this curve going to look like? Who said, who said I, I didn't say, you said a triangle? Yes. Okay, so you mean up and down? What it would, it, uh, ah, okay. All right, so you're correct. It's gonna start off going up and it's gonna follow a straight line, but then what happens? It's not gonna go back down. It's gonna be flat because a viscous object will not recover its, its previous shape unless, you're, unless you push back in the other direction. So a viscous curve will look something like this, where this is the amount of permanent deformation. Okay. So let's look at plastic. So th does anyone know how plastic deformation, I mean, if, if what plastic deformation might look like on this kind of diagram, stress versus strain rate, given what I said before? Anyone want to take a chance on this? This is not, it's not entirely intuitive. Um, with, a, with an ideal, what's sometimes called a perfect plastic, there is a critical yield stress. And, and so if you are below that critical yield stress, you will realize no strain rate. Strain rate will be zero. But as soon as you raise your stress to that critical yield stress, you can achieve any number of strain rates. It just depends on how fast your boundary conditions are moving. So a perfect plastic uh, behaves very differently than an ideal viscous solid. So it's important not to confuse these two terms because they represent very, very different sorts of phenomena. Okay, uh, so that's plastic. But let's, let's go to some more complicated objects. And, and, and you're going to see words here that I think many of you, uh, uh, certainly the seismologists and geodynamicists will recognize. A Maxwell body. So a Maxwell solid, Maxwell body, or, or also known as elastico viscous, not to be confused with viscoelastic, because that's the next one. Uh, but elastic viscous solid is a spring and a dash pot in series. So, same thought experiment. T0, we apply a constant stress. T1, we remove it. Okay. So I like the beginning of that. It's gonna start by going straight up because the first thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna feel the spring. So it's going, to, it's going to consume that much, uh, or it's going to experience that much strain right away. Then this dash pot's gonna kick in. We're gonna see some time-dependent deformation. What happens, though, when we take the stress away? 
is derived in, in essence from a from a multi anvil uh, type design. It's a cubic it's a cubic assembly that sits between uh, six different rams, and so you've got two pushing this way and four resisting motion this way. Um, you can get to much higher pressures, much higher temperatures on really tiny samples. The real value of this is it can be done on a beam line. So you can take, you, you don't take it, it lives at the synchrotron. Um, and by shooting x-rays through the sample, you're able to get very precise, somewhat precise stress measurements on these very, very tiny samples. Limitations, low strain, and very tiny sample volume. So again, strengths and, and weaknesses. Um, me, yeah. How does the synchrotron, the, the X-ray, go through, go to the sample? You've been surrounded by steel. Yeah. So it, it actually shoots between the gaps in the anvil, right here. It's designed. It's designed so that. I, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't have the right the right cartoon here. But the the X-ray line comes in like this and goes out over here, and all of the materials that surround the sample have to be X-ray transparent. Um, so this is uh, the other apparatus that I have in my lab. This is, this is an apparatus that, that is, is sort of of my own design, my own construction. LVT stands for large volume torsion apparatus. And so the idea here is to take samples that are roughly the same size as the samples in the Griggs rig, but instead of just squeezing them like this, we can twist them. And by twisting something, it gives you the, it allows you to generate much larger strains. Um, and uh, just to show one very quick example of some of the work that we've done uh, recently, this is work uh, that my postdoc Andy Cross uh, just published. It's on two phase mixtures of, of uh, in this case, calcite and anhydrite, which are really nice model materials for studying two phase flow. Um, you see here the strains, so a, a shear strain of 17 and a shear strain of 57, which is pretty close to the record for uh, uh, experimental rock deformation. Um, and you can see very distinct differences in the microstructures of these rocks. And so, you know, one of the things, if you've heard me give talks before, I spent a lot of time yammering on about microstructure, but microstructure is something that's critically important to the study of viscosity. Okay, or the study of rheology. You cannot understand rheology without understanding the representative microstructures and how those microstructures evolve. And so that's what this rig is all about, is just generating those microstructures so we can study them. The flip side, so you know, very large strains, but almost no stress resolution. So there are, there are trade-offs here. Um, I'll just show. Uh, Phil? Yeah. How, how are you measuring the? I'm over here. <laughs> How are you measuring the shear strain on those two uh, photomicrographs or images? <laughs> you can't see it, um, but right, right here, we put a strain marker in. So we sputter coat gold, and we init it's initially vertical, and we can watch it shear like so. Um, and so you can't really see it except on the electron microscope. But you can actually this this particular sample we twist it around. Two and a half times, and so you can actually you can see the strain marker repeating multiple times. It goes around, goes around again, goes around again. Um, so that's how we're that's how we're estimating the strain. And and one last uh, type of apparatus, and this is this is kind of different. Um, and actually, uh, Peter mentioned uh, at the end of his talk that one of the things that we really don't understand very well is low temperature plastic rheology. Um, and in fact, that's something I totally agree. It's something that we don't understand very well at all, but it's critically important to understanding the dynamics of these slabs at really low pressures and temperatures. And one of the ways that we've been uh, approaching this is to make friends with the material scientists, because they're typically about 20 years ahead of us. Um, and so uh, recently, I've started working with, uh, with uh, so a colleague at Wash U who has a nano indenter. So a nano indenter is a standard material science technique for measuring plastic deformation of all sorts of things from thin films and metals and ceramics and everything else. Um, so we, we have borrowed her nano indenter. And we've done indentation experiments 
on olivine single crystals. And so that's, that's uh, published in this, uh, this paper here, which is in GRL. Um, and so you see this little triangular shape here. That is the, that is the shape of the indenter that we're pushing into the, into the rock. So some of you may have encountered um, Vickers indenters or other sorts of indentation tools. The nano indenter is wonderful because the indents are, well, they're nano sized, so really, really tiny indents. Um, but the important thing from the perspective of understanding plasticity is that in a nano indenter, this, the sample, it, it, you know, usually we have to worry about getting to really high pressures to keep the sample from fracturing. But in a nano indenter, this, the geometry of this is such that the, the, the single crystal acts like a little pressure vessel. So you can get to incredibly high uh, stresses without having to worry about brittle deformation. And so this is, this was done at, um, we did experiments at up to 200 degrees, which I think we can all agree is pretty cold even for, even for uh, subduction zones. Um, and so, uh, but even at room temperature, even at, uh, we, we did experiments at, uh, at I think, what did it, 10C. And even at 10C, we could see uh, plastic behavior in the olivine. So we've used this to parameterize some new low temperature plastic flow laws. Our, our, our latest effort is to use the same tool, but to do what are called micropillar compression experiments. So we, using a focused ion beam, we machine out a one micron diameter pillar, and then we push on it. Um, and it's not entirely clear in this photograph, but there's actually, this was, this, again, this was at uh, room temperature. There's a shear band here. And when you look at it under the TEM, you can see the formation of dislocations. You can see that those dislocations have moved. It's not brittle, but that's purely plastic offset, which you're able to do because the pillar is so tiny. So I'm happy to talk, anyone's interested in this, you can tell I'm obviously pretty excited, but I'm happy to talk about this some more. But I think this is one of the really cutting edge approaches in rock mechanics. Okay, so, Question? yeah. It's a mechanical device. Yes. The indenter is actually a mechanical device. Yes. Yeah. So you you have you have um, an extremely sharp tip with a particular geometry that you push into the sample at a known with a known amount of force and at a known rate. And very very precise electronics allow you to measure the stresses to to incredibly high precision. Thank you. Sean. So you mentioned most of the exper experiments are using those synthetic samples, which are like grind uh, olivines. So, but uh, the how could you study the grain size effect uh, dependence? Or you don't care? Or I, oh, I, I care very much. But in this particular, in this case, you can't. And that's a good. That's a good. So, Sean, Sean is asking. Well, here I'm poking at a single crystal, so it doesn't see any grain boundaries necessarily. So this is getting at the very fundamental property of the single crystal, but it doesn't answer the question of what the grain boundaries do. Um, so even like May and uh, Kostech, that very um, classic paper, they don't really, they, th their sample is actually very fine grain, right? Yes. So not really comparable with the upper mental condition, is that right? Um, not without some grain size extrapolation. But let's come back to that point. Other questions before I go on? Okay. So that, that was sort of a, a, a sidebar just to talk about some of the different options we have for deforming rocks. I'm going to return now, though, to the May and, and Colstead experiments in the Patterson apparatus. Um, there's a couple different ways we do experiments. Uh, we can hold the stress constant and measure the strain rate. That's also known as a creep test. Uh, it's not highlighted here, but the other option is to hold strain rate constant and measure stress. So it's two different methods of getting what should be, in, in theory, the same, uh, the same information. But in, uh, in the Colstead lab, they like to do creep tests, so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and so this is what the, the raw data looks like. And I, and I really love the fact that they actually put their raw data in the paper because 
uh, I can't think of any other e example where people put um, the millivolts of their thermocouple in the paper as opposed to the calculated temperature. But that's what they do. So um, the basic process for doing, a, doing an experiment, you start off, of course, at room temperature and pressure. In this case, they raise the pressure to the desired uh, 300 megapascals or whatever it is. They increase the temperature slowly uh, over about a couple of hours. And then they do a series of creep tests at different loads. And I've put some converted quantities over here to make this a little bit uh, easier. Um, so from 16 megapascals up to about 200 megapascals. So they'll do, they'll hold it at a constant load. And then down here you can see what that uh, creep compliance curve looks like. So uh, displacement here, which is just a, a essentially strain, versus time down here. And so they'll do one, cur uh, one, uh, uh, one creep test and look at the response. They'll increase, uh, increase the load, look at the response again. And they'll do this, uh, in this case, nine or 10 times over the course of a single experiment. And this, as you can see, this took place in one workday. Um, a, a series of these creep tests at progressively higher stresses and therefore progressively higher strain rates. One thing that um, I'd like to call your attention to is the magnitude of the strain that each individual creep chest achieved. Now they will, they will argue, and I think rightfully so, that all of their experiments reached steady state. Um, but each of these experiments was, was to perhaps less than 1% strain. So while, it, yes, indeed, it did achieve steady state, there are some, there are some complications, I would argue, when you're extrapolating to, um, to mantle materials, for, for, which do not reach steady state so quickly. We can zoom in on one of these. Not really zoom in. This is just a cartoon that I made. Um, <laughs> um, because you know, as 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 you may you may be looking at this and saying, um, so if we if we think back to our our Maxwell body versus our our Burger's body, like why do we care about one versus the other? It, it's it certainly looks like it's achieving steady state strain rate very quickly, and and indeed I think it does. But if we zoom in, what what we would see is it actually looks something like this with the elastic response, the transient response, and then the steady state uh, response. So. When we're measuring, uh, when we're deriving flow laws, um, we are typically interested in this steady state response here. Oops. And we're, we're ignoring that transient there. But that transient contains a lot of valuable information. And I think this is another uh, area uh, that's, that's ripe for exploration, is going and looking at, these, at this transient evolution uh, of, the, of the rheology at very, very tiny strains. Okay, so we've done our experiments. Now we want to we want to characterize the deformed sample um, because, as I as I said earlier, the microstructures that are generated by deformation have a huge effect on the rheology. Um, in this particular study, they they didn't do all these different analyses, so I've pulled some from from similar sorts of papers. But you might look at the grain size. You might look at the crystallographic dislocations. That's going to tell you something about which deformation mechanism is operative. Um, you might look at grain scale microstructures using techniques like EBSD, which I, I expect a lot of you are familiar with. And you might look at the lattice preferred orientation that's generated by deformation. So all of these things help provide a richer picture for both the rheology, but also, uh, at least in this case, the, the seismic signature of a deformed rock. So we, we like to do all these things on all of our deformed samples. And then finally, we've got to take all this information, all this microstructural data, all this mechanical data, and we've got to fit it to some relevant flow law. Um, I'm going to go through this really quickly because I think you're going to hear more about this later in the week um, or, or next week. There's a lot of different deformation mechanisms with our with our Silly putty, we, we looked at four mechanisms, but even just amongst the viscoplastic deformation mechanisms, we have various forms of dislocation creep for which strain rate and stress are nonlinear. We have various flavors of diffusion creep for which strain rate and stress are linearly related, but then uh, in diffusion, excuse me, in diffusion creep, there's also a grain size sensitivity. 
And then what we've done is we've taken all of these various sensitivities, sensitivity to stress, sensitivity to grain size, sensitivity to the presence of melt, water, temperature, pressure. We've combined them all into these giant constitutive expressions, which, which may be uh, familiar to you. The point being that in order to fully parameterize the rheology of a material, you actually need to know a lot of stuff. And, and it's, it's, I don't think there's been any single study that is able to uh, study, test all of these different variables. Um, so what we've relied on over the years is, is a few labs focusing on different areas and slowly constructing um, these very, uh, unfortunately, very complicated, well, it's fortunate for us, unfortunate for you guys, um, very complicated flow laws. Now, in, this, in, the, in the case of May and Colstead, uh, they, they fit their data to a similar sort of expression. Um, so this is from a single experiment now. Um, and each of these dots, or maybe it's two experiments, but each of these, each of these points here is a single creep test. And they're showing uh, for some constant temperature, pressure, water activity, et cetera, the relationship between strain rate and stress. And so at low stresses and low strain rates, they see that that relationship is quasi-linear, which we typically associate with diffusion creep. When you get to higher stresses, then there's sort of this, this curvature here. So when you get to higher stresses and higher strain rates, the relationship becomes nonlinear with a, with a stress exponent of three, which is typically indicative of dislocation creep. Then we can take all that data and we can plot it, put it on some sort of Arrhenius type plot where we look at strain rate as a function of reciprocal temperature. And we see then this is how we derive our activation energy. Um, so that gives us the temperature sensitivity. Um, and then and slowly we start to fill out these constitutive laws. And then the last thing that we do um, particularly for the purposes of extrapolating to nature, uh, we like to put everything onto something called deformation mechanism map. How many of you guys have heard that term before? A few of you, good, okay. So a deformation mechanism map is just a way of displaying uh, in, in typically two-dimensional space, uh, in this case I've got stress versus grain size, where different deformation mechanisms dominate. And the assumption that goes into the calculation of a deformation mechanism map is that each of these deformation mechanisms is independent, meaning all of them can be operative at the same time, but some, uh, under some conditions, one may be easier than another. Um, this particular map um, has four deformation mechanisms on it. So dislocation creep and diffusion creep, which I've just described, those, those are data that, come, that came from that May and Colstead paper. Low temperature plasticity, which I've also described. And then there's this uh, mysterious dislocation accommodated grain boundary sliding mechanism, which I'd rather not talk about, um, but, but we can talk about it offline. It's, it's, it's a somewhat um, controversial thing to, uh, to understand. Um, the point that I want to make, though, so, so if, we're, if we're in the mantle and we've got really, I think someone said yesterday, millimeter scale grains um, and slow strain rates, so we may be somewhere out here. Mind you, this is calculated at constant temperature, pressure, composition, water concentration, and melt fraction. We might be somewhere out here. We might be on the boundary between one or two deformation mechanisms. In fact, it's very rare that a single deformation mechanism dominates the rheology. I, I like to plot my deformation mechanism maps a little bit differently than others. I put these black regions in here to indicate the places where no single deformation mechanism exceeds 40% of the total strain rate. And what you'll see if you plot deformation mechanism maps in this, in this way is that under most conditions, you have at least two deformation mechanisms contributing substantive, substantively to the rheology at all times. So I think Peter uh, in his talk showed some models with dislocation creep, some models with diffusion creep. But really, it's these composite rheologies that take into account multiple deformation mechanisms that are probably more accurate, uh, at least from the perspective of rock mechanics. I think that's all I wanted to stay here. OK, um, I'm basically done. I just want to um, describe very briefly what we're going to do this afternoon so we can, we can hit the ground running when we start the tutorial.
Um, we're going to be over in, uh, in McCone again in 365. Um, we're going to be doing experiments, uh, uh, creep experiments, uh, on paraffin. Um, and we're using this, this little rig here, which I've called Prada, Portable Rock Analog Deformation Apparatus. It took me a long time to come up with that. Thank you for laughing. Um, and uh, we, ha we have 10 of these over in the, uh, in the, in the hall, uh, over in Macomb. The, these, this is a very classic deadweight creep deformation apparatus. So we're going to be doing these experiments at room pressure and room temperature on these, on these little cylinders of paraffin. So basically what that means is we'll put a cylinder of paraffin there, we'll put some weights on top, and we'll look to see how quickly the paraffin deforms. And through all, by, by working together, all 10 groups, we should be able to parameterize a very nice flow law for paraffin wax at room pressure and room temperature. Um, and even better, we're going to be able to, to compare that to a published flow law. I don't know if Claudio is still here. Um, oh, there he is. OK, so there, there uh, was a, a wonderful paper published uh, in 1999 uh, with, with Claudio as the, as the senior author uh, on the rheology of paraffin wax. And so we'll be able to compare our data to their published flow law. So um, and it, it works, don't worry. <laughs> so. Um, We've got the 10 apparatus. We've already, um, uh, my uh, staff person has already kindly prepared all the cylinders, so we don't have to do that. Each group is going to do two or three creep tests, and then we'll compare our results um, to, uh, to the published work. So uh, thank you, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions now. OK, let's start off with some uh, questions uh, from the students, postdocs. Um, yeah. yeah, I guess in the example from the main Colstead paper you had, it looked like the stress exponent changed gradually between one and three. Is that common? Yes. Um, it's a good observation. So that's because what's, what's happening right here is you've got roughly f your strain rate is just the sum of the two deformation mechanisms. So if the, if the, and this is part of the reason we know, by the way, that these deformation mechanisms are going on at the same time. They're, it's not one or the other, but they're, they're additive. Um, so if it, was, if it was just one or the other, we would expect the data points to follow these dashed lines, which would be the, the single deformation mechanism flow laws. But as I said, virtually all experiments, and, and for a large fraction of nature, we expect at least a fractional contribution of a secondary deformation mechanism. So Phil, just to follow that up then, how you would figure out the percentage of each would be just sort of geometrically from the deviation from those straight lines? Or? Right, so the straight lines are, are, are fits to a lot of data. So the, these, are, these straight lines are the calculated flow laws. So you have to, you have to deconvolve the, the fractional contributions of the two. Um, and this is, this is part of the reason why the, the dislocation accommodated grain boundary sliding mechanism is so difficult to understand, because that takes place right here in the center. So you actually, under most conditions, you actually have, at least according to their interpretation, three mechanisms happening at the same time. And so you've got to be able to subtract out all those bits and pieces. Uh, we're, we're doing students and postdocs. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So, a lot of the research has been focused on olivine, but we know the mantle is up to 40% maybe pyroxenes, and when you start adding water, the uh, partitioning, the water prefers to go in pyroxene. So how, how confident are we that olivine is what's controlling the rheology, the mantle? Not. I, I, and that's, that's a very helpful leading question, because it's actually one of my, my main research interests is trying to figure out what happens when you add a little bit of pyroxene into your sample. It's not a simple averaging thing. It's not, you know, I've got 80% olivine and 20% pyroxene, so I'm going to average the flow laws together. Um, it's much more complicated than that. And the reason is because of the microstructure effect. Um, jump ahead. Uh, I'll just show this. So I, I, I showed these earlier. Uh, but these were some, um, some samples uh, collected by Yolene Lincolns, who was a postdoc who worked with me several years ago. Um, 
uh, from the Lonzo Massif. And so these, these are, it's, I'm going to show you a series of three slides that are a transect across a shear zone. So from a relatively undeformed sample to a moderately deformed sample to the most highly deformed sample, you can see that there are, and, and these fine grained layers in here, which appear black uh, in this photomicrograph, those are very intimately mixed olivine and pyroxene grains. Rheologically, this sample is completely different from this sample, and it's because of the presence of the pyroxene. If you didn't have pyroxene, this sample and this sample would look totally different, and the rheology would be totally different. So yeah, it's a, it's a real problem. Um, uh, sh shouldn't say problem. It's an opportunity um, for all of us to start thinking about you know, how can we bridge this gap between traditional rock mechanics, which is focused on these, this, these beautiful, well-parameterized olivine flow laws, and the types of samples that we actually see in nature. So this connection between the structural geologists, and the rock mechanicists, and the modelers, I think, is really bound up in understanding these sorts of phenomena. Good question. Other questions from students, post staff? Yeah. Uh, so my question is about phase transformations. So how would phase transformations and uh, uh, something like mechanical twinning or, f or twinning caused by phase transformations affect the rheology? So I've got to be careful in case my department chair is watching. Um, the, uh, so one way that one way that phase transformations are are thought to influence rheology is that as something passes through a phase transition and is recrystallized, the grain size is modified, and the, especially if you have multiple phases uh, going undergoing reactions at the same time, phases can be mixed together uh, very effectively. Um, and, and Slava Solomatov has some very nice theoretical treatments of this, particularly as pertains uh, subducting slabs passing through the 660 and, and undergoing transitions. I think we've, we've heard about that earlier this week. Um, but in general, I think the, the main effect, at least in my, my naive view, is that the main effect of phase, tra phase transformations is on the grain size of the sample, uh, and hence, and it would influence it as such. So you would expect the grain size to become smaller because of the phase transformation? Right, because as you go through uh, this, the, uh, uh, a nucleation and growth process, as it passes through a phase transition, often the grain size is, is highly reduced. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from students and postdocs? Okay, well, let's open it up to uh, anybody with a, with a question. Yeah, Wayne. Uh, you know, Greg Kurth has uh, argued many times that you can extrapolate those laws um, over the size and, 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 and time as well. I, I, I'm wondering, you know, what, what's your take, especially if you go beyond you know, just a pure olivine system. Yeah, so um, I think on this point, Greg and I largely agree. Um, you know, part of the reason we, we use these deformation mechanism maps is it provides us with that, the context to make that extrapolation. So, you know, obviously when we're doing experiments in the lab, we're doing them over, you know, time scales of 10 to the five seconds, 10 to the six seconds. And then we need to extrapolate nine orders of magnitude or so to get to uh, geologic timescales. When is that extrapolation robust? It is robust as long as the mechanism, the physical mechanism of deformation in the lab is the same as the physical mechanism of deformation in the field. Part of the reason a lot of us like microstructure so much is it provides us with the ability to, to infer deformation mechanisms. So, if we look in the field, we see uh, abundant uh, uh, evidence for deformation by, say, dislocation creep. Well, then if we have a well-parameterized dislocation creep flow law, even if it was parameterized at much faster strain rates, that extrapolation is, is considered uh, to be quite robust. Um, now, 
it does mean that that extrapolation is going to be very sensitive to small uncertainties in parameters, um, and that's that's a fair that's a fair concern. But just like briefly comment on that. I mean, the, yeah. the nice thing is that when you take these flow laws, for example, you you take a dry olivine composite rheology, as several people have done, diffusion dislocation creep. You plug it into a global flow model, compute the strain rates. It sort of works in the sense of predicting predominance of dislocation creep in the depth regions of the upper mantle where we see the strongest LPO, presumably LPO-induced anisotropy. Yeah. And so the average viscosities you get are not too far from the ones you would expect based on post-glacial rebound, the geoid modeling we discussed, and so on. That's right. There are details in that, for example, this works if you take the published flow laws for dry olivine, sort of only, and if it's wet, it's somewhat too weak, and this may be real or it may not be a real effect. Right. But broadly speaking, plugging these things in as composite flow laws sort of works. Yeah. And that gives you confidence. You may, it, this may be a coincidence, right? We may be seeing a composite behavior of perks in olivine, just as, just happens to look like dry olivine. Yeah. But there are other ways of looking at it, and it's pretty much consistent, it would seem. Yeah, I, I agree. The, the one place where I would say that the, the flow laws probably don't work very well is right along plate boundary interfaces. So ductile shear zones, like well, I took the slide down. Bulk mantle, I, I agree. I think the olivine rheologies seem to work pretty well, and I sure hope it's not a coincidence. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of dials in that flow law. And there's a lot of things, for example, the pressure effect. You know, what the activation volume of creep is a hotly debated number, and I think people just threw up their hands because they couldn't agree on it, but that one, that one parameter can have a huge effect on, on what you see, so. Maybe I can rephrase my question. <laughs> you know, you have this, this uh, um, deformation mechanism map for, say, for olivine, but let's say you know, in any regime, you already said that, you know, there's more than one mechanism at work. But now let's say we have a similar map for pyroxene. And now you have to superimpose those two maps. What happened? Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, but yes, you're, you're right. I mean, this is, this is just olivine, and it's just at these conditions. You know, let's not forget that, that we can turn the water dial. We can turn the melt dial. We can change the pressure. Like I said, the pressure can actually have a huge effect. And then you add secondary phases or tertiary phases, and yeah, I mean, it, it, makes, things, it makes things really complicated. Um, and that's, I, I keep coming back to this microstructure thing, but part of the reason microstructure is important is it allows us to extract information about process. And with process and enough theory, you know, we should be able to forward model a lot of the, a lot of this uh, over any number of timescales. I'm going to just make a quick question based on the earlier question about phase changes. So, so you said the main effect would be grain size, and that certainly seems that would be a large effect. But how do we know that, say, ringwoodite uh, would have the same kind of rheology as as olivine? It oh, it doesn't. Like yeah. it probably doesn't. It, right? it doesn't. So, and I, I think we. So there would Obviously, additionally be a, the effect that, of the fact that the crystal is totally different. So. Absolutely. Yeah, and actually another good example of this is post-perovskite, which is thought to have, uh, uh, I think it's thought to have a quite uh, weak rheology in comparison to some of the other lower mantle phases. But of course, as you get to those higher pressures, it becomes increasingly hard to make these precise measurements. Um, so it's certainly a, it's an area of, of active interest is looking across these phase transitions at, at strength contrast. Uh, so I just want to ask something a bit different to, uh, to I don't know, provoke some competition here. But so you're 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 sort of heading, you know, facing ever more complicated challenges in doing these experiments. You want to go to sort of reasonable size volumes and much higher pressures, etc. So um, presumably there's a computational group out there who is trying to work in the moment they're stuck on 10 atoms or something. Yeah. Who's going to win that part <laughs> of the story and when? Um, they'll win, but it's going to be after I retire, is my prediction. <laughs> now, there, there, are, there are certainly people who are trying to do um, you know, polycrystalline simulations, and they can, 
you know, for example, there, there's a large group of people uh, working with the L software package, which you may be familiar with, which is a microstructure modeling package. And right now what's very nice is, is we can compare experimental results to those numerical models and we can get a sense for you know, how, good, how good those models are, but ultimately they're limited by whatever physics has to go into them. Um, and there's still, uh, at this point I would say that the, the models have not caught up to the experiments in terms of the sophistication of the microscale physics that has to go into them. But yeah, I, I assume there's some great groups. There's a guy at, uh, at Cornell in material science who uh, Donna Blackman often works with. Um, and uh, he's got some really sophisticated polycrystal, polymineralic simulations that can, that can do a lot of things. So. I guess to add on what Boyd was asking, which is what I, I was going to ask. There's, you were just addressing this issue of homogenization, right? How do you deal with the mixture behavior? But I think at least partially what Louis was asking about, what about the ab initio stuff, right? How far are we from pure sort of single crystal simulations of a pyroxene at arbitrary pressures, right? Something like that, right? like, a, like a smaller building block. Right, so it's at the, at the sub-grain scale, you're saying, yeah. yeah. Pure material Uh, pe people have attempted to, to infer rheology from, from these sorts of ab initio calculations. I think the, you know, I don't, I don't stay so up to date on this literature, but I, I think that the, one of the challenges is, you know, if you're, you're looking at defect driven deformation, so dislocation creep, you've got to put a dislocation into your ab initio calculation. And then you're constrained very much by the size of that calculation. Now the spacing of dislocations in actual materials is quite large. So what people can do is they can put a single dislocation in there and, and do the sort of dislocation dynamics calculations. But going from there all the way up to polycrystalline deformation is a huge leap because you don't know how the dislocations are interacting. You don't know how they're uh, dealing with grain boundaries and all these other things that influence uh, the dynamics of a dislocation. So it, it's, not, it's not an intractable problem. Um, I, my understanding is at this point it's, it's fairly far off. Okay, well, I, oh, one more question here. I have an elementary question. Okay, it's, uh, uh, from at the beginning you described the distinction between elasticity, viscosity, and plasticity. And I have been troubled by the, by the distinction between viscosity and plasticity. For example, uh, in the uh, flow laws mm -hmm. you, you have given, uh, the, these are viscous deformation, yes. right? But the, the title of the paper by, by Kostad and, uh, and May, yeah. and it's called plasticity deformation. So, the distinction between these two names quite often has troubled me. I, I'm not quite sure there is an effort to unify or to better define these two terms. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm being a little pedantic using, using the very strict definition of plasticity. The, the reality is that if you have a highly nonlinear viscous rheology, it's going to behave like a plastic. So mm -hmm. when they talk about Plasticity, in this case, they're talking about some very uh, highly nonlinear rheology. It's not, I guess it's not strictly c correct, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's necessarily problematic. Also, uh, the, the model you showed, the simple model you showed, the plasticity, is applying a, a force to it and then it deforms infinitely, right? Yes. And how is that related to the super plasticity you showed us with the uh, Silly putty. Um, so, I guess just to be clear, you know, the, the those little cartoons that I'm drawing are are you know purely conceptual end members. Right? They, there's no material that behaves as a perfect plastic. Yeah, I just um, want to make the connection. I, I think what you what you're seeing is is a transition between ideally viscous behavior and ideally plastic behavior that is related to this nonlinear relationship between stress and strain. The, the reality is that all, rocks are falling somewhere between an ideal viscous solid and an ideal plastic solid. If, I don't know if that's satisfactory, but that's... Yeah. 
Okay, I think we're all getting a little bit hungry, hungry. here, so uh, <laughs> let's thank Phil and... Uh, <clears throat>